Welcome to Fran Coach's Franchising 101 podcast series. Here we talk about all things franchising. What is it all about? Is it for you? How do you find the best one to own? And so much more. Now your host, Tim Parmeter. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to the latest edition of Fran Coach's Franchising 101 podcast series. I'm Tim Parmeter, founder and CEO of Fran Coach and your Franchising 101 host. Today, we have a fantastic guest with us that is uh, one of our franchise partners in the fast casual food arena. Um, we tell clients all the time, franchising is so much more than just food, but guess what? It is also food. And this is really, I think, one of the premier opportunities out there. So we're excited to bring them on. Um, joining us today is the Executive Director of Franchise Growth, which is a super cool title, by the way, uh, for Teriyaki Madness, Mr. Tyler DeMuth. Tyler, how are you today? Living the dream, Tim. Always happy to talk teriyaki any given day of the week. So, uh, you know, thanks for having me on and uh, look forward to, to going through and answering any questions and uh, getting people up to speed on, on all things teriyaki madness. Well, uh, well, bu- well, buckle up, brother. We're going to, we got a lot to talk about with uh, the, the madness that is teriyaki madness. But first, dude, we don't care about teriyaki madness. Right now, we care about you. So, I always love hearing people a little, little background about Tyler. Like, and again, think readers digest not dissertation when you go into this right but, sure. but um give us a little on your background and, and how did you get into this crazy industry that is franchising yeah and i i think it's uh, probably similar to a lot of folks in the sense that i kind of stumbled into the franchise world uh always been aware of franchises like you're you know everyone always initially jumps to food right and taco bell and wendy's I knew that was a franchise, um, but I started off in the website hosting uh, and marketing world. So we were running campaigns for franchisees, franchisors, Kill 'em Up Cheese, a um, couple of others, and that's where I kind of got my feet wet. Um, long story short, my dad got sick. I had a midlife crisis at God knows what, 26, 27 years old. Uh, moved back here to Denver. And then, um, you know, Teriyaki Madness found me. And I was sitting there like maybe a a lot of folks that could be listening to this podcast where I was like, what is Teriyaki Madness and why should I care? Um, And so I basically took my digital background. I scraped all of the entire footprint of Teriyaki Madness from an SEO standpoint, online reviews. What's the community? Saying about you know franchising and more importantly teriyaki madness, and it was a cult following, uh, cult in the best possible way. Um, <laughs> and so we went and tried the food uh, out here in Denver at one of our local shops. Uh, loved the food, and I was like, okay, I get it. It's not Panda Express. Um, you know, it's a premium product at a slightly premium price, but we focus on ingredients and being highly customizable um, and tailoring it to different individuals based on dietary restrictions, food needs, but also just providing a clean product. And that was important to me. Um, and then really what sold me on, on Teriyaki Madness and joining up with the, the team was really the team. Uh, led by Michael Haith, our owner and CEO, who acquired the business uh, from our founders in 2016. Uh, but he comes from a heavy background of being in the franchise space. He was a franchisee, owned two different concepts as a franchisor that he ended up selling to buy out the founders. And the part that I loved about it is that he put his own money where his mouth was. So uh, he really kind of focused on the pillar. Uh, of franchising or pillars for that matter, which is formalized systems, processes, support. Um, and I think that's a big reason why we can work with folks that don't necessarily come from food backgrounds. I think about 75, 80% of my system comes from limited, if not zero food background. So we've overdone training. And that I think is what has led to all the success that uh, you know we've seen since Michael took over in 2016. So I've been here about five years now. Yeah, and and I, I, I've been around seven and a half in the industry, and was Teriyaki Madness one of the first ones I got introduced to, and the the change from when Michael came over, and really just like I was always kind of said like he kind of brought in like an all star team from a leadership standpoint when there were just a handful of these out there, which and like you said, and he he wasn't doing this playing with somebody else's money, right? Like this was 
This is out of his own pocket, right? Um, and uh, so which is which is super cool. And we want to get into the support and everything like that in a moment. But I'm still stuck on the fact that you're having a midlife crisis at 26, 27. What am I have? What is it called when I'm at 53? Because that's really like I almost just like kicked you off right there for that. But I, I, I you know, I've known you a long that's time. I like timing. you, brother. So I'm gonna let it slide. But <laughs> know your audience at least. My from DNA the host. doesn't last very long, Tim. My <laughs> DNA doesn't last very long. So you gotta like what you do. And I think uh, you know, I've had maybe five or six bad days in the last five years. So uh, you know, it, it's good to be part of a good team. So uh, yeah, midlife crisis. So at 26, 27, not yeah, great. No, and 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 you and you guys do like the just the 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 team that's involved, um, just top to bottom, fantastic. Whether they're front facing, it's somebody behind the scenes. It is it is high quality across the board um, with that. And let's, let's go back to the teriyaki madness, right? Because from a from a food concept. Yeah. Um, pretend like we're a consumer, right? So you guys aren't selling cheeseburgers and pizza with something called teriyaki mattis. What are, what are, what, what are we going to see as a consumer standpoint? We're hungry. We want something to eat. What can we come get? Yeah. So um, for teriyaki madness, we're not trying to be everything to everyone, but what we do, we want to make sure we're some of the best at. So it's a limited menu. You come in, you select a base. So your white rice, your brown rice, fried rice across either one of those two, um, or yakisoba noodles. You pick a protein. Our core proteins are chicken, steak, tofu, and salmon. And there's variations of each. So we got spicy chickens, our biggest seller for folks that have been to a shop more than two times. Um, and then it's that customizability. So we have about, uh, I think we have nine um, sauces that we make uh, in-house um, as of today. And, you know, it's pick your own adventure. Um, so if you want our spicy sauce wrapped around orange chicken, so it still has the crunch of orange chicken, but more of a, a flavorful sauce instead of sweet, we can do that. Um, and then it comes with a five vegetable medley. Uh, made to order, so you're typically about a five to eight minute ticket time in general. Handful of appetizers like uh, egg rolls, crab rangoons, chicken pot stickers edamame, uh, and a couple of others. But once again, I'll, I'll say that we just want to be the best at just a few things. And I think you hold on to about 85 total SKUs as a restaurant owner um, across all recipes, marinade sauces. So it's easy to manage, but there's still more bowl variations than there are days in the year. Um, <laughs> so you can come to TMAD, you know, three, five times a week, and you get a, a different product, different flavor profiles that speaks to anyone from 10, you know, young kids, right, all the way up to uh, 55, 65, 70 and beyond, uh, because it is as healthy as you want it to be. Um, we kind of hang out in that health aware group, so not necessarily health conscious, but folks that are kind of aware of what they're putting in their body and want to make sure that they're eating high quality ingredients first, you know, vegetables that were sliced, uh, you know, five weeks ago in a factory. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, might have been the tomato I saw at the subway here locally the other day. So, and you <laughs> you you referenced Panda, and I always use Panda Express when I when I explain you guys because um, I and you rattled off a few of those menu items that I have had before that are tasty. And even though I just had lunch, I'm hungry now from that. But Panda is, I think, the bigger one that people are going to know. And you can't really trash them, but I, I don't mind, right? But it's you go into Panda Express, everything's in the bowl already behind the counter. And maybe it just got dumped in there. Maybe it's been there for 25 minutes. We don't really know, right? And I think one of the biggest things, and I know you guys will talk more about the ingredients and product and all those things, and not to discount that, but from a consumer standpoint, I come to TMAD, it is come, I'm getting exactly what I want. It's it's made hot, fresh for me, and poof, there. I'm, yes, I may have to wait a, a, an entire five minutes for my food, right? But I know it's poof, it's it's there, and it's 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 hot and fresh, and and truly makes a big difference from from that standpoint. And now all I'm thinking about is when can I get to a teriyaki madness to eat? So um, that's uh, that's 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 you, not you good. nailed it, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's that hot, fresh, highly customizable. Um, you know, as a comparison, I mean, Panda Express, we get compared to more often than not, which is fair because they're the largest Asian brand out there, right? 2000 right. plus ish locations. 
uh, there's not a lot of competition in our space. Um, and so we do stand out quite a bit. But I think a, a fair comparison or analogy, if you will, that I use is like Panda Express is kind of like a subway where we're kind of like a Jersey Mike's. Um, so we're kind of that premium product, premium price, and, you know, you're paying for it to be, you know, highly customizable and made exactly the way you want. We're sitting under a, a heat lamp for two hours getting dried out. <laughs> yeah, that sounds tasty, doesn't it? Um, so talk <laughs> about that. Talk about the owner, right? And you mentioned, I, I was tell people in franchising in, in almost every case, and we're partnered almost 600 franchises now. And, and almost all of them will tell you the number one thing they're looking for is not industry experience. Um, you could be the biggest slob on the planet and own a cleaning franchise because you're not the one cleaning. Food sometimes is a little bit different, right? But because of all the systems and support you have in place, food background isn't really super important for you guys. I mean, you mentioned a, a big percentage don't have any or much. Talk a little bit about what that owner is doing. What are you looking for if they're not back there scooping up the sauce all day long? What are you really looking for in an owner? Yeah, so that's a, a, a great question. And I'll say it boils down to a couple of things. One is the ability to follow systems, processes, right? Like welcome to franchising. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? If we say cook the egg roll for three minutes, it's three minutes not two minutes and 30 seconds. It's not three minutes and 30 seconds. It's three. So ability to follow systems processes, being highly coachable, I'll say is that other component. And that's why we can work with folks that don't come from food is because through our training, people go through about four weeks, just shy of four weeks of comprehensive training prior to and as they open. Uh, we'll teach them anything there is to know about running a teriyaki madness, top to bottom, whether it's cooking chicken, inventory ordering. Um, but what we don't want to teach is kind of this business mindset, which is the other big thing that we look for. Um, you know, we're looking for a business mentality, a business mindset. We can fill in the gaps in, in the rest. And then lastly, I'll say it's uh, about building teams. So folks that are really good at building teams um, thrive in our system. Uh, because we also don't really want to see owners long-term flipping chicken. Like if it's cathartic to owners to go in there and flip <laughs> chicken, by all means, you'll know a guy, right? Flip away. Uh, but generally, we want to see owners kind of transition pretty quickly from working in the business to working on the business. Um, because their time is better spent managing P&Ls, building the team, building relationships with the local community, and they let their manager run the day-to-day -day show. Um, the only caveat to that is, yeah, when things go wrong, the owner has to grab the back, right? It's still their business. So, if, you know, their whole team wins the lottery, right? And they disappear. Sure, you might, you might be flipping chicken that afternoon. Um, but I always say it's not rocket science, right? I'm not hanging out with Elon Musk on a daily basis, building rocket ships or crazy electric cars. Um, you know, it is a lot of hard work in that first kind of three to six month period. Um, but as long as they're coachable and, you know, willing to follow a process and are good at building teams, we can work with those individuals and they have thrived in our system. We got some of the best validation out there, um, our best franchise feedback or franchise satisfaction, if you will, out there. Um, and we're not doing anything revolutionary outside of the fact that we're, we're promising what we can deliver. And then we very much deliver. And we support that owner from top to bottom throughout their entire life cycle with them because yep. their success is ours and ours is theirs. Yep. And, and I, and I appreciate you guys are always very honest. Like th this shouldn't come as a surprise, but being a franchise owner is, is hard work, right? It, it, even, even if you're a semi absentee owner, you still have to put forth the effort, right? And uh, I, I always use the, the, the acronym FSO, like figure stuff out right? Um, they usually use a different word for the, for the stuff, right? But as an owner, you have like, <laughs> like something's going to happen, right? Um, and you know the best laid plans in the world. What's the old Mike Tyson thing? Everybody's got a plan to get punched in the nose, right? And then, then what do you, then right. what are you going to do, right? Um, you do have to have that mentality. And I appreciate, always appreciate you guys are brutally honest with people. Like, yeah, you got to work your ass off. Like, 
follow the plan, right? You have to understand all the different nuances of this, but it's not, it, it, like I said, it's not rocket science. Um, and the, I think the, yeah. the other, and you, you mentioned a couple of times, and I, I appreciate this greatly because it's, I'll try to stay off my soapbox on labor issues. Oh, there's labor issues. Oh, there's a labor shortage. Sure. There's a leadership shortage, right? And you mentioned Jersey Mike's is my favorite story. It was a Jersey Mike's by our, our house in Florida that the, the guy that runs that thing is the biggest jack you know what on the planet and every time i go he is yelling at people like yelling at the kids behind the counter there's never the same kid behind the counter in like in a two week two week period that has nothing to do with labor shortage that's leadership shortage and that you guys focus so much on that building the team with that and and you have to be able to embrace that and build that build that culture is huge are you still gonna have turnover well y- yes right? I mean, there are executives yep. that have turnover, right? At, at those positions, but the focus on that building the team and that culture is, is huge. So I, I, whoops. And I love that you guys talk about that. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I was chatting to you a couple of weeks ago and that came up, right. I think leadership shortage is the best way to describe it. Um, like I candidly have owners that have turned over their system uh, of employees, maybe two times in 18 months. Um, that's unique in a negative way. Yeah. Um, I have other owners that have the, had the same core staff for the last five or six years, and they love showing up to work. Our model is built around being able to pay a premium wage. So, you know, if you pay minimum wage, you get minimum wage results. It'll usually end up costing you more anyway, but there's always going to be someone else that's willing to pay more than you right? Um, as, a, as a business owner, as a franchise, franchisee, franchisor, same deal. Um, we run a couple of corporate shops. We see it as well. So if we pay a competitive wage and then we build a team or a culture that's around growth and treating people the way they want to be treated, like, yeah, it's not rocket science. Oh. Um, you know, you have to engage the team. You have to care about the team and they will care about you as the business owner. But if you think of them as just, uh, you know, a cog in the wheel, then yeah, you're going to turn over a lot of staff just naturally. And it's like, I don't care what you pay them, whether you pay six figures or 17 bucks an hour, you're going to run into the same stuff. Um, And that's a lot of what we might, what we touch on generally in initial training is, hey, let's think through compensation structures. Let's think through the culture. Teriyaki Madness has their own culture, but internally, every shop owner is going to create their own kind of subculture. Um, And we want to make sure that it's built the right way. You incentivize people the right way. And by incentivize, I'm not just talking dollars, right? It's education. It's learning. uh, How can you help them grow as humans? Um, Because you'll work with young folks from 16 all the way up to semi-retired or quasi-retired people that aren't looking for a wage. They're just looking to stay busy. Um, So there's a lot of non-traditional employees out there that are happy to come to work as long as you treat them right. Right. But if you just treat them like a number, as you said, right, like it's not going to go well. I don't care what business you're looking at. No, it is, it is, it is not, it is not just, it is not just the money, um, from that standpoint. And I just, I, I, I've always appreciated that you, you guys have had that like kind of team building component to it. Um, and one of the things from a staff standpoint, you guys for the, the, the revenue that, that you guys do on average for your stores, which just, and uh, you may not be able to say this, but I will just a little over a million, I think on average, right. Um, which is fantastic for what a small footprint and a small labor model. Um, because what's, what's, what's the current stat how many per how many orders are placed outside the four the four walls this is one of my favorite things and i want to tell a story about trying to call you on your bs with this and then find it out that it was 100 percent true so um what's what's yeah. that, what, what what is that what is that number running pretty closely for you guys right now so pre-covid we did 70 percent of our business outside the four walls in the form of catering third-party delivery or pickup and to go. As we sit today, we probably do 80 to 85% of our business outside the four walls, um, which is crazy, 
right? Um, you know, we have a shop out in California. Um, you know, they're, they're doing huge numbers. Our average unit volume is 1.1 million, 1.16 and some change in our FTD. We have every P&L that's in there that's been open for at least two years, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so highly transparent. Uh, but we got someone out there doing 2.2, almost $2.3 million out of 1,800 square feet. It's crazy. Um, we're not Starbucks, right? We're not having people come in, sit at their laptop. Hey, welcome to eight hours sitting in your teriyaki madness. Um, the food is built to travel. We've leveraged technology in a very heavy way. So our online ordering app, same people that built Smashburger and Qdoba's. Uh, reduces fees of working with third-party delivery vendors. So it still is a very, let's call it healthy, if not a very profitable transaction for folks versus just an UberEats.com. But yeah, we do a lot of business outside the four walls. Uh, we did it pre-COVID. COVID highlighted, mm, let me just make sure I say this right, but like COVID highlighted business strengths and business weaknesses across yes. every segment. No one, I mean, no one that I know in the franchise or world uh, was preparing for a pandemic, right? We didn't see a pandemic coming. Um, but what we did see and why Michael built the business the way he has is that, you know, he, he saw that the restaurant industry is, is starting to collapse footprints, lower employee counts, right? And simple menu. Um, you see it with Buffalo Wild Wings, where they stood up a Buffalo Wild Wings Go which is, operates out of 1,800 square feet. Uh, they don't want to sit on 4,500 square feet or whatever that is. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of business outside the four walls. A big, vast majority of that comes through our own app or our own website versus like an UberEats.com. So it reinforces the margin side. And then I'll just say the food carries and travels well, right? right. So as consumers travel with products and they're, they're looking for more of that kind of right now, um, you know, kind of component as a result of maybe the Amazon culture that, that they built of, you know, right. I want it today or yesterday. Um, you know, we were prepared for that and we had the technology to back it up, but then the, at the end of the day, it doesn't get soggy. Um, you know, burgers, fries, sandwiches, the sogginess factor is the real deal in our experience. Yep. yep. And I think that's the sweet spot. Yeah, no, I th and I think the um, the the packaging thing. I think for for food businesses, March twenty twenty, right when the whole world change changes, like they they weren't prepared for that, right? If it's a pizza, okay, sure, pizza. We 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 know we get that. You guys were already there and um, didn't really. I mean, every, I can't imagine there's a business that didn't take a little bit of a bump. March, April, 2020. Right. But for, especially from a food standpoint, yours is more of a blip versus, oh, oh dear Lord, what are we going to do? Right. Because you had well-trained customers already. You're already getting seven out of 10 of your orders placed outside and going outside. Right. So um, have, having right. that there was, was, was humongous. And, and I, I distinctly remember three, four years ago when you first given me that thing and me sitting in the teriyaki madness in Gilbert, Arizona, I'm like, Tyler's full of crap. There is no way. And I sat there and I faced, <laughs> I faced there and I'm like, I'm counting the next 10 people. And the first two got their food and they sat down and I'm like, he is full of it. And I'll be damned if it wasn't seven out of 10, like got it, whether it was, whether it was Uber Eats, DoorDash, whatever, they got it to go. Now, granted, that's a sample size of 10, right? <laughs> um, but I'm like, oh. and then you, and again, you, you see how it's packaged. It is, you guys, you guys were there already. Well, I mean, way before I think really it was commonplace to go to an app for food, right? Um, you guys were already there very much, very much ahead of the curve. So as everybody's trying to catch up, you guys are just chilling there, killing it with, you know, million, million plus in revenue, right? Um, which is, again, kudos to when I go back to that leadership team that, that, that you're a part right. of with Michael, like, it's all-star caliber that, that, again, people are ahead of the curve and thinking like, not the, well, this is how we've always done it, so therefore let's always do it that way. You, you, you can't think that way anymore. It's, or, well, you can, but you're not going to last, right? So Yeah, cool. you got to always challenge the status quo, right? Like, 
Uh, Michael is a big proponent of that. And, you know, we sat there, you know, January pre-COVID saying, hey, we're three to five years ahead of the industry. COVID land, we saw a drop in sales that first 45 to maybe 70 days, depending on shop location. And then it rebounds. So we were up 32% from a stacked year over a year, same store sales standpoint from 2019 to the end of last year. And it continues to head that direction. But we were basically three to five years ahead to right on track. And so now we're all sitting here saying, okay, what's three to five years from today in terms of the restaurant industry? Um, I think we're about nine months, give or, give or take, away from delivering our first bowl with a drone. Go figure. Teriyaki no madness flying through the air, dropping off food. So we're giving Amazon a run for their money, let's call it. So nice. that's what you know, people should be looking for in a franchisor is, you know, if they're coasting, um, you know, if a franchisor is coasting, they're going to go extinct, whether it's five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever that is, versus, you know, hey, let's, let's turn everything on its head and look at it in a different way. And, you know, hey, everything we do won't, won't make absolute sense, right? Like we run a lot of pilots. One out of 10 of them will clear pilots and be implemented full, full time. But you, you got to be looking at it and challenging how you operate. And I think that's an interesting part that people get from talking with our franchisees is that we do listen. Um, we listen to franchisees. We, we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, is there a better way to do this um, you know, that we maybe haven't thought of? Um, and that's that kind of community or that network of franchisees that we're really looking to partner with long term. We have 114 open as of today. We'll open another 30 to 35 conservatively by the end of this year on track to do north of 60 next year. Um, but they're all very like-minded individuals. Um, you know, they're leaders, they're, they're following system processes, and it, it's just a culture that seems to, to really blend together in a, in a beautiful way. And it, it ends up resulting in a, a beautiful financial performance more often than not. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I love it. And I just, it, it, I think if anything, the, the, with the pandemic, and I think we're probably all way tired of saying the word pandemic, but you, you look back into spring of 2020, it, it, you, it's a, it, adapt or die. And if you can't adapt, like it, you're, it, it's going to be a real, real struggle. And I know you're a sports guy. I'm a big um, money ball right um not the yeah. movie like like the book and the michael lewis book and if somebody hasn't read that i mean watch the movie sure it's fun right but the, the book is fantastic and it's market inefficiencies right um just because we've always done it this way maybe that's the way we still need to do it but if we're not asking the question and we're not looking for other ways it, like eventually you're just going to get you're going to get passed by and the fact that i'm looking forward to that drone dropping off a bowl at my house that's that's pretty sinking cool so um, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll text you my address, uh, for that when we're ready for that. So, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I know you're super busy and are very appreciative of your, of your time. So I'll kind of th float one big last one out there to you. Um, and I know there's probably a million ways you could go with this, but what else would you want, want us to know about teriyaki madness, uh, that maybe we haven't, we haven't talked, that we haven't talked about today. Yeah, I mean, I could probably fill the next two hours, right? I, I love to talk in general, um, you know, so there's a, there's a flavor or component of that. But um, I'll say that we're, we focus on a core skill set. We're simple across the board, whether you're looking at menu, labor counts, uh, sizes of locations. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'll say that we're one of the fastest growing big restaurant chains out there. When you start beating out, you know, Wingstop and Jersey Mike's and, and winning those awards that we have last year and continue to win this year and, and years prior to that even, um, it's knowing who you are, right, and, and who we're looking for. Um, so we have about a four to eight week kind of education qualification process that everyone goes through. Look, we're not for everyone. Everyone is not for us. Right. But what they will get from us, right, um, you know, if, if you introduce them to us, Tim, is, you know, they're going to get transparency. Um, the mousetrap works, right? And, and by mousetrap teriyaki madness in, in terms of a business unit, 
Um, you know, and there, there's clear things we look for as someone goes through the process. But, you know, it's stay in our lane. Uh, we're not going to act like someone we're not. But, you know, it's that culture of individuals that I think has, has been the most impressive for me to watch. Because when I started here, I think I was started at about 31, 32 open sites. Um, we should bring on north of 100 units this year that they'll build out over the next couple of years. Um, and watching that momentum grow and that, that culture, we just had our Teriyaki Madness Conference up in Vail, Colorado. Um, franchisees loved it. Um, because it was shared knowledge, it's shared culture, and, you know, uh, great times financially and otherwise, as long as people are, are following that, that kind of core skill set. But um, the big takeaway, as I'll say, is, you know, think simplicity, think small, right, in general, um, and then very healthy margins. Um, you know, and that's all on our website, in our item 19. Tim, if you, you know, they, they chat with you and want to make that connection, we can get them that information pretty quickly. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. Otherwise, uh, you know, if I start getting into the nuts and bolts, man, you're going to be here. Clear your calendar, buddy. <laughs> Clear your calendar. A three-parter with Tyler and Teriyaki Madness. Um, so no, and I just, <laughs> I, I appreciate you, you, you coming on and, and uh, I, like, I, I, feel kind of crazy that it's we've, I've gone this long do, do, doing doing this and not had you guys on because I just I've I've always one always in, in, enjoy talking and working with you Michael the CEO is as is, is good and just the entire team and everybody of our clients that have taken a look even if they didn't move forward they walk away with just what you said they had a good experience it was transparent right and if anything you guys are like you know, instead of lying to them to get them to be a franchise, you're more likely to scare them off, right? Or or paint a really accurate picture. You got to work hard, right? You got to follow the plan. It, it's it's not going to just like rain thousand dollar bills on day one, right? Um, but if you sure. follow the process and 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 utilize all of the systems of support, it, again, it's not it's it's not rocket science. And and look, guess what? We're always going to eat. And um, as and just over the last several years, we keep getting a little bit more health conscious, right? Like cheeseburgers, good, right? right? But um, it's not necessarily always good for us. And, um, and and again, having something a little healthier, that with better ingredients, all of those things going in there to attract that consumer is is key. So um, I love it, man. Thank you. Well, and I think. Just to kind of piggyback on that, you know, it's, um, you know, the current state of the world, right, is an interesting place, whether you're looking at, you know, pandemics, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, inflation, potential recessions, right? Um, we're very nimble as, a, as an organization. And I think some of the best franchisors are, regardless of size, they're nimble in their thought process. They're quick to execute when need be. But historically, you know, we love recession. Um, you know, 2008, 2009, great for business for us. Turns out we also kind of like pandemics from a transaction standpoint, <laughs> not as humans, right? right? Humans, we're not big fans. Um, but like that's that, that piece that as people are, are starting to pull money out of homes, uh, you know, pull an equity out or to diversify outside of the current business that they, they've been in or are trying to exit. Certain food categories like a teriyaki madness make a lot of sense. There's a lot of other categories that you represent as well that can make a tremendous amount of sense. But we all share that same kind of pillar of being nimble, uh, being performance based, and and putting our franchisees first. Um, you know, the franchisor is at first. Uh, we doubled down when the COVID when COVID came. So we we doubled down on marketing for franchisees and partnering with those folks versus you know, hey, how do we run a new limited time offer to, you know, increase top line revenue, but decrease margin? Um, some franchisors went about it that way, or they played full defense. Uh, we played offense. Um, and it very much has paid for itself. And that's that kind of culture that we've been running with and that, uh, you know, we'll continue to, to grow with. But it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's not all hard work. It's a lot of fun to be had. Um, you know, and what we do over the next five, seven years will be be impressive. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're sitting at 500 plus open locations over the next five, six years. Yeah, nor 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 would I. So 
Um, T- Tyler, thank you, my friend. Always good to uh, to talk to you and uh, hear uh, hear about Teriyaki Madness. So we appreciate you uh, coming on with us today. No, absolute pleasure. Uh, if you guys ever are curious, tap uh, Tim over there, Brain Coach, uh, Franchising 101 podcast. Great, right? Uh, I'll try to listen to my voice for however long this is. But other than that, <laughs> life is good. Great and, Thanks, and great, great way to way to plug the show. So um, and franchising one hundred one podcast dot net, francoach dot net. You want to learn about franchising? You're listening to the franchising one hundred one podcast. Of course you do. Uh, never any fee for our service, whether it's Terry Akimatis or any of the almost six hundred brands we're working with. Let's talk. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Fran Coach's Franchising One Hundred One podcast where our ultimate goal is to help educate you on all things franchising so you can create your better tomorrow.